And many years later, these individuals who took their parents' advice and did, did not pursue what was in their heart end up many years later hating their parents 100%. because they are stuck in a dead end job. One of the things that could be closer to death without dying is having to get up every morning and go to a job you hate. Give me some overarching Spike Lee legend wisdom on what's a good way to think about creativity from your perspective and your journey, not only you and how you do it, but others you've admired and met through the last 40 years that you're like, oh, that's her process. Oh, that's his process. What, what should be the thought process or some hypotheses of how to get there and be successful at it? Well, I want to thank you, Gary V, for <laughs> lobbing a big fat one, a big fat juicy <laughs> fastball. You're, no, you're no, fastball. Oh, a, lob, a, a softball. Right down on the little plate. And I, I for, I'm in my fourth decade as a filmmaker, and I, I speak all the time at universities and, and colleges. And one of the things I always try, try to strive, I try to hit home, is that over the years, over the decades, parents have killed more dreams mm -hmm. than anybody. I'm going to repeat that. Mm -hmm. Parents have killed more dreams than anybody. And this is specifically when we come to the arts. Parents can understand what you, why you go to med school, why you go to business school. But when it comes to the art, many parents have no understanding how you become an actor, a dancer, Orion, a poet, a poet, a painter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is in the arts is is some type of mystical thing and and parents want the best for their children a hundred percent and they think in their wisdom they could get the vice to their children who have nothing want to do with the traditional work thing do you think and, fear parents and, and, do you think and, do you think yeah and a lot of times, knowing how parents might have took a second mortgage out on the house and whatnot and done everything so you could go to a great undergrad school and the bills and these student loans are crazy. And, and so there comes the, that parental pressure and also guilt knowing that what our parents have done. And many years later, these individuals who took their parents' advice and did, did not pursue what was in their heart, end up many years later hating their parents 100%. because they are stuck in a dead end job. Because one of the things that could be closer to death without dying is having to get up every morning and go to a job you hate. Let's talk about that strategy. And I think I want to highlight, Gary, what you did with V Friends, and um, which has been massively successful. For those of you who don't know, um, right now there was uh, one that was auctioned for as high as 1.2 million, uh, and the lowest current value of, of it is of one is 30k. So, what did you do to bring branding and generate over 91 million dollars in the first 90 days? And then I do want to come back to blockchain, but I want to start with some of those strategies. Well, the thing that is most fascinating to me about the blockchain, and, when, and a lot of my friends reached out to me when I went so hard, and they're like, man, I've watched you for 15 years, leave so much money on the table to preserve your reputation. Why are you ruining it now? Basically is what they were saying. You're doing something so high risk. And, I'm at, and I said to them, I said, you don't understand the blockchain. It's actually the reverse. If you are the creator of a project, an NFT project, you're actually more in control than anything that has ever happened before. Let me explain. With vFriends, first, I used the utility of the smart contract to create a three-year promise contract of a conference called VCon that I'm doing at US Bank Stadium in Minnesota in May, which, you know, it's, it's a profound lineup of, every, of the who's who. Michael's even coming, and I don't think he's ever been to Minnesota. And so, like, you know, it's, you know, it's, it is cold there. I am aware. You should do it's May. Spring. Thank you. Um, the, you know, and so first 
I think people are not using the utility aspect of NFTs enough right now. Right now we're in the art and collectible phase, no different than the internet in 94, we were in the information age, right? The internet's awesome for information. The internet was awesome for information, it was also gonna do so many more things in our society. The blockchain right now is on art and collectibles, but it's a contract. And so I I did a three year conference, I did a lot of access tokens um, where Zooms, like information, things that people actually value besides the collectible, but the part that I was referring to earlier, and this is why I wanted to be in business, you know, candy's really the only other major thing I'm really involved in, Mm. is that I knew how Michael thought about the consumer. Let me just paint the picture for everybody who's hesitant to do an NFT project because they actually are good people and they fear that the value goes down. With, with Candy, with me friends, if God forbid the market crashes and so, you know, it's one thing for all the people that spent $2,000 for it last May and are selling it for 30, 40, 70, 100,000, they did great. But what about the guy or girl who bought it today for 40,000 and the market goes to 8,000? Right. For me, because it's on the blockchain, I can provide more value for that person. You're the central bank, you're the country, you're in control. So I just, you know, I've been telling a lot of my friends who I think have not the best behavior in mind who are gonna be like, well, they made it, you know, they bought it, they took a risk. I'm like, it works a little bit different. You're in control of that economy and your reputation is completely tied in. So I think for the people that have good intent and have resources and are smart, for me, I take a lot of USD off the table with my project and put it in one place just for the rainy day so I can deploy that capital back to the people that own vFriends and I think the best projects will do that. Gary, hi, how are you going? Um, my name is Burkan. Firstly, I fucking love you. You're love a you legend. Back, um, you. And secondly, my, um, my question relates to TikTok. You kind of spoke about it a little bit towards the end there, but I was already in the line and it was too late to change my mind and not ask the question. <laughs> Go ahead. So here we go. Um, strategies in terms of TikTok. I am a sales coach currently um, and I want to start posting more on TikTok. I do Instagram and Facebook already. What do you recommend? Any selfless- I, would do, I would do 10 things the way you exactly do them elsewhere and watch them not work, I would consume a shitload of content on TikTok and see trends, and then I would mimic those trends in in your interpretation. For example, one of the trends on TikTok is to actually film another phone of your content on a different platform and talk over it. So you could literally take one phone, play your sales video on, on Facebook, and then record with another phone and talk over and say, hey kids, because you know it's younger, this is what I'm saying on Facebook, the version for you to practice now is this. Right. You see where I'm going? Yeah, 100%. You have to come up, you have to consume. The reason I always do well is I listen for hundreds of hours before I talk. It's not obvious to you because you're only seeing the talking part. You don't see the 14 hours that I put in in listening to TikTok content on the flight here, right? It's the same reason I'm gonna crush sports cards. This flight here wasn't TikTok, it was sports cards. You know, eventually everyone's gonna be like, how are you right about soccer and wrestling and basketball cards? It's because I read for 14 hours the sale prices on auctions on those categories and then read articles and then went on Twitter and searched what people are talking about. I put in the fucking work. You don't need me to give you the strategy for TikTok. Go live in TikTok for 100 hours and you'll figure it out. Cool, thank you. You got it. I view that content is the oxygen that creates awareness around what you're doing. So to your point, if you stop creating to do something, you in essence are turning off the oxygen of what you're doing. So the reason I have continuously content created even though I've gotten remarkably busier in my time is because I agree with that. I think once you stop creating, you become less vulnerable. Oprah Winfrey's businesses are not as impactful today as they were a decade ago because she doesn't have her show. That's just real life. And so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer that at all costs, as a matter of fact, one of my biggest anxiety points professionally is that because now vFriends is so successful in taking up my time, while I still have to run VaynerX, the thing that, you know, we only have so much time in the day. The biggest casualty to the huge success that I have in NFT land is my content. 
I am definitely in a different output place. I mean, I went seven, eight years without putting out four pieces of content on my Instagram every day and now I get two a day and that's like a big day and that adds up. And so I'm, I'm conscious of that, I think about that. Bro, the music ta- talent without work ethic was a wasted opportunity. That's it. You understand? Yeah. It's yeah. fucking a wasted opportunity. Yeah. I just think about that shit all the time. How many people had loads of talent that either didn't fight to find it? I'm always curious about that. Like who was the greatest painter of all time? Really? But she or he never decided to paint. Gave up. Yeah. Not even gave up. It's just no, it didn't even. Didn't even go. Didn't even yeah. Yeah. Uh, Novak Djokovic, when I was chopping with him, had there not been a tennis court behind his family's um, he never went out. restaurant, he would have never gone there. Crazy. And instead, he would have been into skiing. He's the greatest. He's gonna be when it's all said and done. The greatest male tennis player of all time. Huh? The serendipity of a tennis court. Like, I think about that shit. This is why but, I push curiosity so first. heavy. Like, try <laughs> shit. Just try some shit. Yeah. You were fuck. If you said no, I don't sing and just stayed home and played video games or whatever. You don't know what would have happened. Not I know what would have happened. All the good shit that's happened last two years wouldn't have fucking happened. <laughs> yeah. That's what I know. That part wouldn't have happened. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <I know. laughs>